and your walk is like all the other ones. It's going to run from to now till about 45 minutes out to an hour, and it's going to be followed by Q&A and or a roundtable discussion. So our speaker today, as you saw from the handout, is Alexandra Kusilak. She's an education consultant with advanced care planning and the goals of care from uh, Alberta Health Services. Her talk is going to help planners understand how to communicate with their clients and how clients can document their wishes for future health care and personal decisions. Advanced care planning is the process of talking about and documenting health care wishes within the personal directive document prepared by lawyers and the client documents that are tied back to the care of goals of care in the green slate. So I think today understanding the terminology, what it all means, and how it fits together will make you a better advisor. So without further ado, I'll turn this over to our guest speaker, Alexandra. Hi. First of all, can everybody see the screen? Great. So a little bit of background about myself. I'm an educator with Alberta Health Services, and all I do all day long is teach about advanced care planning goals of care. So I teach physicians, nurses, and the public. So this has got to be the best place I've ever presented. Usually I'm in a church basement or some dusty room at Foothill. So thank you for inviting me and giving me the, the great opportunity. So I'd like to start by sort of asking, how many people here have their own personal directive? Probably I'm talking to the converted. So I'm not sure if you realize, but what we teach in Alberta Health Services is that everyone over the age of 18 should have a personal directive. Because if something happened, if you went home today and when you're in a motor vehicle accident, who would make decisions for you in terms of medical decisions and personal decisions? And would that person know what you would want? So my background is a social worker, so I've been a social worker for over 35 years and I've worked in various um, settings, acute care, rehab, long-term care, supported living, uh, the gamut. And my introduction or working with personal directive was always at the end when it needed to be enacted. And that's when the family really needed it in terms of telling them what this person wanted to uh, want it and reassuring the family that they were doing the right thing. Unfortunately, um, most personal directives that are drafted by lawyers do not give us any information as healthcare providers to help us with that. So that's part of the reason I'm here today. The other part of it is that agents and uh, lawyers are not very well educated in terms of how the personal directive is enacted and how it affects in terms of the healthcare, what people get and also in terms of the goals of care. So that's what I'm going to go through today. So my understanding is most of you are financial advisors or in that thing. So when we're doing our financial planning, you are probably have asking a lot of questions of your clients in terms of are they conservative? Are they willing to take risks? Are they setting up a trust? All these questions in terms for, for you to know that person better, for you to be able to get that financial plan that meets with the requirements. What are they going to do in retirement? How much money do they need? But we don't ask those questions in terms of health care. And the result is, if I can remove my slide, is this. So can everybody see the slide? So if, you, if you've seen this cartoon before, I apologize, but we have very few cartoons about advanced care planning. So I don't know about you, but I don't want my wine thrown out. Uh, for some people, the computer is probably more important. But this is the issue that we have, is that people are thinking they're saying one thing, um, and it's being misinterpreted by family and also by healthcare providers. So we have to be very clear. And the document that is used most likely to do that in terms of the personal directive isn't very clear. So I'm going to go through the personal directives, how I see it on our end as healthcare providers, what that advanced care planning process should look like, and how is it connected to healthcare, uh, and what is that funny thing called the green sleeve, which I have as hands out, and what is that goal of care system. So um, just so that we're all on the same page, uh, you all know the personal directive, it's not a will, it's not enduring poverty, and that's really important to make sure that you talk to people if they don't have one about that, because people think that if they have a will, I'm good to go, I don't need anything more, right? So my father was one of those, um, that he thought, I have a will, what's your issue, I'm just going to die. But I'll talk about it a little later on why, why that's a fallacy in terms of that's not how things work. An enduring power attorney is only for money. So we have it even on, it drives me crazy, on our healthcare chart, somebody has an enduring power attorney. Well, unless I need to get some cup of coffee, it's not going to help me in terms of making healthcare decisions for that person. So 
So it's the legal document. People don't realize advanced care planning is a process that you go through, and personal directive is that legal document that makes val your wishes and values legal. And we, I'm sure you're all aware that we have a personal directive act that follows that up, that makes sure that service providers ask for the personal directive, that makes sure that we follow the personal directive, whether they're, whether they're agent or a service provider. So um, the other part of it is that people think, oh, I don't want to do a personal directive because then somebody's going to take over and make all the decisions for me. Personal directive act doesn't come, personal directive doesn't come into play until we lack capacity. And there's a really huge process for that. Um, I just redid my personal directive, and unfortunately, the lawyer gave me old forms that haven't been in use since before 2008 to enact the personal directive. Uh, if you don't know, they can only be enacted by a Schedule 2 and a Schedule 3. Um, it's clearly written out in the Personal Directive Act. We can't do it on a letter from the physician. It can't be done on a prescription pad. If you are old enough and remember the Form 1, it can't be done on any of that. The Personal Directive Act is quite clear. It's a Schedule 2 or Schedule 3. Um, the other part is that, um, is that this is what we usually get in the hospital if somebody's written a uh, personal directive with a lawyer, and it doesn't tell us very much. Um, it's a form. You could slap anybody's name in it, and it's usually the same form, just the name has changed. Well, when I told you about your, is everybody's financial plan the same? Probably not, right? Uh, are your wishes and values the same as your next door neighbors? Probably not. So that personal directive, I always tell people, it's a reflection of you, right? Of what your wishes and values are, of what's important to you. Because how are we supposed to make medical decisions if we don't know what you want? And the only way we can do that is if we understand what your values and wishes are. The other part about this one is that it says, I will lack capacity when two medical practitioners authorized to carry on a practice um, determine that I lack capacity. In the province of Alberta, it is very difficult to get two practitioners to be told that you lack capacity. If you land up in the hospital, not so bad. They can grab another doctor. If you're in the community, think about it, you're only seeing one doctor, right? Your family physician. If you're 80 and have dementia and your, your daughter says, who's the agent, you know what? I really need that personal directive enacted because mom's making really weird decisions. Um, she goes to the doctor, but she finds out the form needs two physicians. Where's that physician going to end the other physician? It can cost the family up to thousands of dollars to have that other um, document filled out by a physician. So I really discourage people to put in those two physicians. It really makes... Um, the family's life difficult, it makes our life difficult as social workers and physicians because we need to find that other person. If they don't put in anything, it defaults to a physician or a psychologist along with another service provider. A lot easier to do. But if you look at the Personal Directive Act, you can appoint someone to determine your capacity along with that physician and psychologist. That can be a friend, that could be the agent. So your family is gonna know when you lack capacity way sooner than the physician probably. So I've given you out the form um, that the uh, Office of the Public Guardian give out, and it's not that you, wanna, you may wanna use it, but it has a spot there for saying, who will declare um, me to lack um, capacity? So that's just a reminder of, it's not a given that it has to be two physicians. There's nowhere in the act. Unfortunately, though, if you put two physicians, we have to go with two physicians. So I put this uh, next part on the screen. It says, in general, I do not wish my life to be prolonged by artificial means when I'm in a coma or persistent vegetative state, and it goes on. <coughs> Most of us will not land up in a persistent vegetative state. And usually that's the only medical values or wishes that we have in a personal directive. As medical providers, it tells us nothing. What if you have a stroke? What if you have dementia? What if you're hit by a car? What if you're paralyzed? What if you have surgery that may cause other outcomes? We know nothing. Okay? So this statement, uh, although lawyers love to use the statement, it tells us nothing. Okay? And there's another statement always that, you know, that uh, I want pain medication. There is nowhere in healthcare we are going to with, not give you pain medication. Um, so that again, it's an empty statement because you're always going to be offered pain medication. 
So I'm going to show you a video. This is Dr. Charlie Court. He's actually from Australia. But he does a really good job of encapsulating what advanced care planning is and why it's so important and why we have such a tough time as um, medical providers. I'm hoping the sound is from somewhere. Yeah. About 80% of people at the end of their life are in a position where they can't make their own decisions. I'm Associate Professor Charlie Cork, and I'm a specialist in intensive care medicine. Uh, some people will say that my family know what to do, or my doctor will know what to do, and they're, unfortunately they're wrong. <clears throat> when a family's got an advanced care plan and knows what their relative wants, it is enormously easier for the family, because they haven't got all the responsibility of making these what they see as impossible decisions. And it makes it ever so much easier for the doctors, because doctors are trying to do the right thing. They just need to know what it is. I think advanced care planning, in a nutshell, is three important things. It's about thinking about it, and just thinking about it starts the process happening. <clears throat> talking about it, talking about it to your family, talking about it to your doctor. The third thing is picking a great decision maker. 80% of us, right at the end, will not be able to make our decisions. Just at the end of life, the way the process goes, you're not able to make decisions, and decisions need to be made. And a great decision maker is able to talk to the family, talk to the doctors, make a decision, make the right decision for you, and to feel comfortable about it. And it makes the whole process so straightforward, so controlled, and so sensible, and that's really, really good. So what happens if we don't do it, or why should we do it? Um, like Charlie Cork said, it's a really, it's great when it works. So getting back to my dad who said, you know, I have a will, what's the big issue? I'll just die, what kind of um, decisions do have to be made? Well, if he died in 1940s or 50s, he would have been right, because we die differently than we did back in the 40s and 50s. We didn't have all the bells and whistles. The um, majority of people were, were about two weeks ill before they died. Appendicitis killed you, flu killed you, lots of things we couldn't do anything about. 85% of us now will die in one of these trajectories. Um, so whether it's a terminal illness, organ failure, or frailty, it's over time. Right? We even have uh, a term for living with advanced cancer. So people die differently in terms of it's over time. You might even have friends or relatives that have dementia, and they're in a nursing home maybe for a length of 10 years. And over that 10 years, um, decisions have to be made, right, in terms of what kind of medication, who do they associate with, how do they dress, who can visit them. So if you think about it, if it's your mother and she's in long-term care, did you have that discussion about what she wanted? Did she go for quality? Did she go for quantity? Did she say, prolong my life as long as you can? Or did she say, you know what? If I have dementia, don't prolong my life, right? So don't have that flu shot. I don't want all those bells and whistles. Because families are in agony because it's not that they want to do bad for their family. It's that they don't know what to do. And that's usually, as a social worker, why I was called in. Um, and sometimes the personal directive helped because there was something in there that we could latch on to, but a lot of times it didn't. So not only um, are we um, uh, dying differently in terms of over time, but the time of death in terms of 42% will require some kind of decision making, right? Somebody has to make a decision. I don't know if you realize you can tell your clients in the province of Alberta, even your husband and wife cannot make end of life decisions without a personal directive or without a guardianship order, right? So it's very important that we pick who we want. Medical, medical decisions can be made with a form six um, but there's only relatives listed on that form. So if you have a friend that wants to make decisions for you or you want them to make decisions for you because that's the person that knows you best, they won't be able to if you don't fill out a personal directive. So these are the five steps to advanced care planning. So this is the stuff that needs to be done before we get to that personal directive. So just like you have those conversations with your clients in terms of what's important to them, what do they want to do in the future, these are our steps. 
So think about your wishes and values. So what's important to you? Uh, is it quality of life? Is it quantity? Um, are you happy if you can just watch hockey and eat ice cream? Um, what gives you joy in your life? So those are the kind of things that we need in that personal directive to understand people a little bit more. The second one is learn about your own health. I can't plan for next year if I don't know that I may not be here next year, right? If I have a terminal illness and my life is so short, I'm going to be planning for next week, not next year, right? If I don't know what my diabetes is going to look like a year from now or two years from now, how do I plan? And we have a big issue in our healthcare system. Is there's a lot of people that don't understand their diagnosis, um, then don't understand what's down the line for them, right? So their diagnosis and prognosis is written all over our healthcare charts, but they don't have a good understanding, right? So they need to go to the doctor and have that discussion about what does this mean for me in a year, in two years. Choose someone to make decisions and speak on your behalf. Um, a lot of people fill up a personal directive the same time they do the will, stick it in their safety deposit box, never tell the person who they've picked as an agent, um, and never look at it again. When we choose someone to make decisions and speak on our, on our behalf, it has to be somebody who knows us, who's going to make decisions as we would, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be a relative, doesn't have to be your husband or wife, it can be a friend. It doesn't even have to be anybody that's living in the province, right? As long as we can reach them by phone, they can be our agent. So, um, you know, on my personal directive, I have my husband and my daughter because I think between the two of them, they'll muddle through it and they'll figure out what to do, right? But I think my husband alone, he may have issues and I think my daughter alone may have issues. The other part of that is what if my husband dies? Um, I need somebody else to do it, so I'm going to make sure I'm going to name more than one person on my personal directive. I had a lovely lady. She named her adult daughter as her agent. Um, fortunately, um, the PD was enacted. Her adult daughter died before she did, left without an agent, right? Nobody else named on that personal directive. So then somebody has to go to court to get a guardianship order, right? The fourth one is really important in terms of, you said you all had personal directives. Does the agent that you've named know what your values are? Have you talked about your health wishes with them, right? Have you talked to your family about what your health wishes are? Christmas is coming, it's a great conversation around the tree, right? In terms of, <laughs> if I have that whatever, what are you going to do? They did a study and actually they asked husbands, what does your wife want? And they asked the wife, what does your husband want? They were wrong 90% of the time, right? So even husbands and wives never have that conversation and really understand what they would want. Um, my husband told me he wants to be pushed off a mountain somewhere in Banff. I'm not too sure if that's before death or after death. <laughs> Check that one out. So it's important for us to do all of that and stick it in the document, the personal directive, to make it legal so that us as healthcare providers can follow it, so that um, the agent can follow it, so everybody knows what's in there. So there's a lot of steps um, that we need to do before we get that personal directive. The handout I gave you, the conversations matter, goes through those steps and gives examples. So uh, I kind of went through that. So the, another problem is, is that um, you may not, you, you may know, is that personal directive comes in any form, right? You can put it on a napkin. As long as it's signed, witnessed, and dated, it's a legal form, which makes our lives a little bit more difficult because we have to check to make sure it's legal. But people should be giving copies to their agent, to their doctor, to their family members, right? So if you have a family and you've named, you know, your cousin Mike as your agent and the rest of the family doesn't know, Sometimes when that personal director is enacted, families have these fights. Why did she name Mike? So we want those fights to come before that. So give out those personal directives. Yes? Yeah? Do those need to be notarized copies? No. 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 So they just have to be witnessed. And I gave you the copy of the guardian's um, template that they use. On the bottom it says who can and who cannot witness. It's very clear on that. I have a question about yeah. that. Is there any digital solution to share those documents across all those parties that if you change it, it can revoke the previous one on that? Um, yes and no. So um, we do have a registry for personal directives. <coughs> the issue with that is it just names who your agent. It's not a copy of the personal directive, right? Uh, the other part is we have, I don't know if you've heard, Alberta Health Services is supposed to have this brand new fang dangled uh, system called Connect Care. 
I um, don't think it's probably going to come down to Calgary another two to three years. So on that system, you're supposed to be able to upload all your documents, right? So then a lot of people will be able to have access to them. The issue is, is that family physicians, as of now, are not going to be connected into that Connect Care. So in the province of Alberta, we have 1,600 different healthcare computer systems. None of them talk to each other. We will be down to 200, so that's still a huge amount. So I'm going to talk about why we have the um, paper system. So make sure that your clients know that personal directives aren't like wills. It's not by date. So if you don't revoke the previous personal directives, you can have two personal directives in play at the same time. And I've seen it. Uh, it makes our lives really interesting. So you have two different agents named uh, who didn't know about each other. And you may have two different things written on the personal directive. So it's important that if they're making a new uh, personal directive that they void the previous one. Uh, and on that uh, template that's given out, it has a line to saying that. I went uh, over in terms of choosing an agent, and then I can't tell you how important it is is that choosing that agent, right? Um, we have lots of 89-year-old women who think, I'm going to choose my 95-year-old husband to be my agent, right? Not a great idea because the chances of him having um, health issues before her is really high. Um, and also we have the issues of this. The Personal Directive Act is really not clear about when the agent loses capacity. There is no really set way in terms of doing that. Um, so if they lose capacity, then it, it makes it really difficult in terms of having the next person uh, go on. We do tell people that they should have one person um, chosen, a primary one, and then they can choose as many alternate ones as they want. Some people put either or, so if you've got two siblings that go out of town, it's basically whoever ends up in the hospital first is going to make decisions. If they don't work well together, it's going to be sort of not great. And then sometimes they end up in court to, to appoint someone. The other issue is I always got that lady says, you know what, I have five kids and I want to name all five of them. Mm -hmm. So they do Mary and John and Dick down the line. Great for family a unity, but I don't know about your family. My family, if five different people were named, they'd be 20 different decisions and 20 different opinions. They all have to make a decision together. As healthcare providers, we have to contact them all right, at least once. Um, they do have to choose a spokesperson because it's beginning really hard for us, as according to the Personal Directive Act and majority rules. But it's usually not a great pick unless you have kids that really work well together. So those are some things um, that you need to think about. So it's not a simple idea, oh, I'll choose my husband, right? It may be the best person, but it may also may not be the best person. So your agent plays a role. They should have a copy of the personal directive. So all those people that they've got their personal directive in their safety deposit box, not great. As healthcare providers, if we can't see that personal directive, it's like you never did it. So all that money that you wasted at lawyers, it's gone. Um, the only thing that sometimes saved us and people is that somebody's taken a copy and put it on a chart somewhere. Still, when we had a lot of paper charts. We could we dug it up and it was good to go because um, according to the Personal Director Act, we do uh, take copies. It doesn't have to be the original. Um, we will only ask for the original if there's like white out on it. It looks a little odd, and I've seen those. So the great thing about the Personal Directive and the Act is, is that if somebody chooses an agent, they have responsibilities. Um, they have to keep a record of the decisions they made for up to two years, and also there's a complaint process. So as healthcare providers, if we find the agents not following the personal directive, we can complain to the Office of the Public Guardian. They are really responsive within a couple of days. Um, they will investigate. If they feel that agent needs to be removed, then they'll do that or appoint someone. Um, and sometimes it's just a reminder of what the agent's responsibilities are, and then everything goes on it. So the big question is in terms of what do I write? So you should really write about quality of life statements. But sometimes, I don't know the age of the people that you work with, if you're elderly, if you have, or even if you're not elderly, but you have a health condition, you may want to write in your uh, personal directive that I don't want CPR. Everybody know what CPR is? Okay. I don't want to be resuscitated, right? Mm -hmm. I don't want to go to the ICU again. 
Um, I've got, I'm on dialysis, but I don't want that anymore, right? I'd want to be put back on dialysis. Um, I've had cancer treatment, but I don't want that anymore, right? So, or they might be really specific about, um, I don't want to be in a nursing home, which is a hard one. But if they have lots of money, um, that can be done, right? For some people, it's not an option. So things that is really important to them around their health care should be in that personal directive. So the other thing is, is that um, if you've got uh, certain religious, if you don't want blood products, if you um, want things about dementia in there, for, in my personal directive, because I've worked so much for it, I've got, if I can't recognize my family, I don't want my life prolonged. So that would mean no flu shots. I've been even written it more specific in terms of no feeding tubes, um, no force feeding. It's, it's all in my personal directive because those are things that matter to me, right? So if I'm in that situation, my family will have a template. They will know exactly what I want. So some people with uh, have specific end-of-life decisions. You may think it's kind of silly or, you know, they'll know what to do. We have a video on our site, on our Conversations Matter, which is our website. Uh, her was a volunteer. Her name is Deborah Cook. And her mother had written out a personal directive, and she had put in there what her end-of-life wishes were, is that she wanted to be surrounded by family, she wanted music played, um, and she wanted everybody there. So that's what they did. The facility wasn't too thrilled because they thought they were having a party, but they did that. Um, and the family had great solace about they were able to fulfill their mother's wishes. They did exactly what she wanted, right? And they knew that her ending was the way she wanted. So people usually ask about medical assistance in dying. Does everybody know what that is? Okay. So for medical assistance in dying, uh, usually a lawyer will not put in your personal directive because you cannot put anything that's illegal. Personal directive doesn't come into play until it's enacted, so until you lose capacity. You can't ask for medical assistance in dying if you don't have capacity. Um, I am, you know, they they're looking at changing that. Whether that'll go through or not, I do not know. But as, as of now, we can't follow it in somebody's personal directive. The other thing is in terms of organ donation, although that is too changing, in terms of the way it goes right now is that your family owns your organs, right, in terms of they make the decision. So even if you've put it in your personal directive that you want organ donation, they can veto it. Uh, they are looking at changing the laws and saying if you don't put that you don't want organ donation, then it's an automatic. So we'll see how where that goes. It's a great place, though, for, fan, for to put things in you want, because it means a lot to us. If you say, I'd want medical assistance in dying if this and this happened, then that does tell you, us about your values and wishes. I'm not going to go so much about the witnesses. It's on the bottom. It's something that you can read on your own. I'm not, I'm going to go through common issues in terms of that we have as healthcare providers that really makes it difficult for us for the families and for the patient. Um, they don't know the agent, they don't let the agent know that they were appointed. So we call up the person and say, you're the agent, we've enacted the personal directive. And the agent says, what, who, uh, I ain't doing it. So we're left without an agent, right? So it's really important that that agent know they've been appointed. Or somebody says, oh, I have a personal directive with my safety deposit box and they will not show it to anyone. They will not take it out. So when the time comes that somebody needs it, we probably won't get to it. Um, I talked about the two physicians, how difficult that is, especially if people live in rural areas, it's even harder um, to get that two physicians. Um, and not outlying your wishes is really probably the biggest thing, because what is your family to follow? Right. I, uh, my mother actually saved it. She, I knew what she wanted. She had a discussion with me. The doctors who were sort of second guessing me and, and wanting to do something different, but because she had written it in her personal directive, it had to be followed, right? So there's no question about what to do because it's there, it's legal, um, and it had to be followed. So some, I've seen a personal directive that was like 24 pages. Uh, it had scenario A, scenario B, scenario, and it went through these different <coughs> scenarios. None of those scenarios happened. We had a different scenario. So sometimes when you're so specific, um, things don't really happen unless you have that specific disease. My godmother had a heart issue. She had open heart surgery. She never wanted open heart surgery again. 
right? So she was very specific. That's something to happen to her. But the scenarios that were in that person were things that would never happen uh, or could never happen, and they were so specific we couldn't use them. So it's better to be broader if you don't have something specific. So I don't have any medical conditions right now, a little bit, uh, but five years from now, my personal direction may be a lot different, right? In terms of if I have something, I may change it, right? The same, th that's why we don't want you to lock away that personal directive. We want you to review it on a yearly basis because is that agent still somebody you want or is it your ex-husband, right? You don't want your ex-husband making your decisions. And just because you're divorced, if that's who's on your personal directive, that's who's going to be making decisions for you. Or let's say that person's no longer willing to do it, or your situation's changed, right? So it's something, a document that you want to review and change um, as needed. So how does this all fit with healthcare? So what I've been talking about, I don't know if it's on the right or the left, is that green bubble, right? Everybody over the age of 18 can do a personal directive because we never know what's going to go down the line. We can think about what our healthcare values are, what our wishes are, and we can document that in a personal directive. When we come up to the healthcare system, things change. So if we are in the hospital and we have something going on, we need to know as healthcare providers what kind of healthcare you want in that instance. So that if you collapse, uh, we know exactly what to do. So a long time ago, it used to be called do not resuscitate orders, right? But now which we're much more sophisticated and it's called goals of care. And that goals of care is determined with by a discussion with yourself and your physician, taking into account what your values and goals are and coming up with a goal of care that's appropriate for you medically and appropriate for your values. So that set goes up here, and I brought samples of the green slaves, so if it's something that you want, um, you can pick up. So our goals of care are divided into three sections, resuscitative care, medical care, and comfort care. There's only really one way to explain to you goals of care, and that's to show you them on a video, because it's things we do to people. It's very uh, physical in terms of what we do in terms of whether you have resuscitated care or comfort care. So we've developed a video. I'm pretty proud of this video. It was developed in Calgary as local people. It shows you what um, CPR looks like. It shows you what the ICU looks like. So if you're anybody squeamish here, just remember that these are actors, right? They're, nothing is real. Uh, it was done in our lab in, uh, in Foothills. And also, the person that's receiving the CPR um, is a very large doll. So if you're getting squeamish, just think large doll, large doll. Goals of care are designations used by your healthcare providers to describe the general aims of your healthcare and the preferred location of that care. Decisions about goals of care usually arise over time through conversations between you, your family, or loved ones and your healthcare team. The process of thinking about, talking about, and documenting your wishes for healthcare is called advanced care planning. In a medical emergency, your goals of care designation guides your healthcare team to provide timely care that is both medically appropriate and reflects your personal values and wishes. There are three general approaches to care or goals of care, resuscitative care, medical care, and comfort care. In resuscitative care, the main goal of care is to prolong life by curing or controlling your health condition. This means that doctors and nurses could use intensive medical and surgical interventions if these are needed to keep you alive and could be expected to cure or control your illness. If your heart stops, they may perform cardiopulmonary resuscitation or CPR. You may have seen resuscitation or CPR performed on television or in the movies. The person usually recovers easily, but this doesn't tell the whole story. 
Resuscitation measures like CPR work best in emergency situations where the heart stops suddenly, but the person is otherwise pretty healthy. It's important to know that CPR normally cannot restart the heart or restore life when the heart has stopped as a result of a severe or terminal illness. In CPR, the doctor or nurse repeatedly pushes on the chest with great force and periodically puts air into the lungs. Electric shocks called defibrillation may also be used to restart the heart, as some medicines might also be given. If the patient's heart starts to beat again, most patients require a stay in intensive care and a period of rehabilitation before they are well enough to leave hospital and some people are left with permanent damage from their heart stopping. Resuscitative care can also include using medications and other treatments that are provided in an intensive care unit or ICU. The ICU is a very specialized unit in a hospital with doctors and nurses who are trained in using special equipment and medications to care for very sick people. An intervention that may be used in the ICU to prolong your life is a ventilating machine. These machines are used if you're unable to breathe on your own. This means putting a tube which is attached to a machine down the throat into the windpipe to push air into your lungs. Because this tube can be quite uncomfortable, people are often given medications to keep them very sleepy or sedated. You cannot eat or talk while on this machine. If you have a potentially curable or treatable condition, ICU care might be needed to help you heal. The hope is that you will return to your previous health, but it is important to understand. Resuscitative care and procedures used with the aim of prolonging life may or may not achieve that aim of restoring your previous health. In medical care, the goal of care is also to prolong life and to cure or control your health condition, but without the use of resuscitative care and the ICU. Good morning, Mr. Mrs. Johnson. How are you this morning? Medical care can be appropriate if your health condition is such that intensive or resuscitative care, such as CPR and a breathing tube, are unlikely to work. Or your wishes and values about health care may be that you would not be accepting of these intensive medical treatments. For example, if they are unlikely to restore you to a state of health that you would want. In the medical approach to care, your doctors and nurses will provide tests and treatments for any treatable problems that may arise. This approach may include surgery and medical treatments <clears throat> such as blood transfusions, kidney dialysis, feeding tubes, antibiotics, and other medicines or fluids given through your veins. Most of these treatments mean going to the hospital. Of course, you know, you know how much she understands. Okay. Hi, Pat. Good afternoon. Oh. Some people want to receive only the life prolonging treatments that can be provided in their home or in the care center where they live, even if this limits what treatments are possible. If your goals include a desire to avoid going to the hospital for treatment, talk to your doctor about what treatments may be available and helpful to you in your home or care center. When your health condition or your values and wishes reflect a goal of maximizing comfort and relieving symptoms, this approach is called comfort care. Your doctors and nurses will give you medicines and other medical treatments to help control uncomfortable symptoms such as pain, trouble breathing, or feeling sick to your stomach. The main goal is not to prolong life, it is to maximize your comfort. Resuscitative treatments are not used. Comfort care does not mean that you receive less care. It means the focus of your medical care is on quality of life and reduction of symptoms. People receiving comfort care are usually treated at home, in hospice, or in a long-term care center. However, sometimes hospitalization may be needed to provide optimum comfort. You know, he feels a lot weaker when uh, he can't keep anything down. In the hospital, the approach to care will continue to be focused on providing comfort and relieving symptoms. It's helpful to keep in mind your wishes 
and to know about your own health condition when you are discussing goals of care. Resuscitative care, medical care, and comfort care can be divided into more specific subcategories called goals of care designations. These subcategories provide your healthcare team with important information to help guide medical decisions about your treatment. Talk to your healthcare team about which goals of care designation best reflects your wishes and health circumstances. Very sad music at the end. <laughs> so just to let you know, they talked about comfort care and they showed that poor gentleman in bed. Um, nowadays with our advances, we have lots of people who are independent, who no longer, treatment doesn't help them maybe for cancer, but their symptoms are under control and they can live independently uh, with comfort care in their own home, doing their own thing. Some people are even working months to years. Uh, right? It's just a, our uh, medical system has changed so quickly in terms of what we can do for certain things. It does look a little bit different. Like comfort care can mean hospice or could mean somebody in their own home. Um, in the booklets I've given you, it goes through the, the goals of care in great detail. There's uh, seven of them. Um, and sort of to illustrate the point, I'm just going to tell you the story of my mother. So if all of us, if we don't have a goal of care that's filled out by a physician, we're considered R1, meaning that if I collapse, you're going to call EMS, yeah, call EMS, um, and they're going to come and they're going to do absolutely everything that they can do, right? They're going to do everything, they're going to take me to the hospital and they're going to do it there because I'm relatively healthy and, and things shouldn't work. My mother, who's 88, had arthritis, she's got some other issues. Uh, high blood pressure, she's not feeling uh, the greatest, and she said, you know what, uh, I've seen your dad go through his stroke, I don't want CPR, if something happens, just let me go. No goal of care, right? So off we trotted to the doctors, right, because we need this so that when EMS comes, they're not going to jump on her chest. So we, we talked to the doctor, he filled out the form and made her M1. So she's still going to the hospital, she's still getting investigations, but she's not going to get CPR or ICU. Um, later on, my mother has a stroke, runs in the family, so uh, off we go to emergency. She's not getting CPR or ICU, but they're able to remove the clot, right? Um, she's in the hospital, not a great time, lots of delirium. Finally, she's better. We're in long-term care. We're doing great, right? But we don't want her to go back into the hospital anymore, right? Not a great place for her. So she, we made her M2. So she's still getting all the medication, she's doing, uh, getting whatever she can in the nursing home, right? So she's going to stay in too. If she worsens, then we might make her comfort care, just depending on, on what that looks like. So is there any questions about that? Yes? Um, say who haven't reached the point of incapacity, or lack of capacity, right. can you elect to have somebody uh, take over in terms of your personal directives prior to that time? Yeah, yes and no. There's such a thing called the supportive decision-making form, um, but it doesn't go all the way as taking over. It's not like a healthcare proxy in other provinces. So notice the word supportive. So you can name up to three people. They can get all the information. They can give information to the physician, but you're, they still have to hear from you as a decision-maker. Right? So it, we don't have somebody, something that takes all it. But you can say, talk to my daughter. She's got the supported decision maker. So in that sense, yes. Is there a document for that? Yes. It's called a supported decision making form. Who knew? Uh, and if you, the easiest way to do it is to Google it. I think it's, uh, I don't form know. Form one, right? McLeod talks about oh, yeah. form one. I think it's one. So this is the actual order. So remember, not everybody needs a goal of care, right? But if you have clients who are older and who say in their personal directive, I don't want CPR, I don't want this and that, and they need it now, they need to see their doctor to make sure that they have one of these or else they're going to get exactly what they didn't want. And yeah? How does it work from a, a practical perspective? If somebody calls EMS mm -hmm. and you have one of these forms on file, before EMS even arrives, they don't know your name? No, so it's in the home. Uh, so it stays, it's filled out by the physician, right? It travels with you, right? So every time I take my mother out of long-term care on a bath, it goes with us, right? Right. So if you were at home, it goes on or around your fridge, uh -huh. so the EMS know to look for it, right? Okay. So they're looking for that green sleeve. 
So it's only written by a physician or a nurse practitioner, so you can't fill it out. You have to have that fulsome discussion with the doctor um, in terms of what are you going to look at. And that's the questions that you should be asking. Okay, if I get all the resuscitative care, what am I going to look at at the other end? Right? Because remember the video, it's not like Grey's Anatomy. Um, you know, you don't get CPR, you don't wake up and date the doctor. It doesn't happen that way. In terms of even in the hospital, um, CPR, in terms of looking the same way you came in, only works 15 to 25 percent of the time. I've seen figures as low as 5 percent, and that's when we're standing right there, right? So for a lot of people, CPR, it was meant for healthy people, right, in terms of drowning victim or, you know, you sat it sudden and you're right there and you can perform CPR. So usually, you know, it'll help, but if you're older and have issues, you're not going to come out the same way you came in. So, like I said, not everyone needs a goal of care, but when they're saying, like my mother, you know, I don't want to be resuscitated, I saw that, I don't want any more, we need to have one of these filled out, right? So even if they say it in their personal directive, EMS can't follow that, the doctor's not going to follow that and unless um, until they change it into a medical order. So the other thing about goals of care is they can change. Just like your personal directive, it's kind of a living document. So should people take this to their phys family physicians. They take it when they go into eMERGE. They take it when they go to rehab. Anywhere along the time, any one of those doctors could feel, you know what, we need to change your goals of care. The patient can request it in terms of saying, um, you know, sometimes even people that are comfort care, sometimes they have some surgery, they feel so great, they say, you know what, I want to go back to resuscitative care because I'm feeling so good, I think life is worth living, so I want to do something else. Any questions about that? I'm almost out of time. Um, so remember that we goals of care, you can have a goal of care without a personal directive and vice versa, right? Um, so that's why a lot of people think they don't need a personal directive because they have a goals of care, but that doesn't tell the whole story, right? So when it's enacted, um, the agent should be making decisions in terms of having that discussion with the physician about what your healthcare should look like and also applying whatever written instructions um, that you've given that would affect the medical decision at the time. So uh, I can stop for questions. I just have a few more slides and then I'll open it up. So this is what the green sleeve looks like. I have. Uh, probably not for everybody, but I have a, quite a few. If you wanted to take one, you're certainly um, welcome to do it. If you've got parents or yourself that want to have that discussion with the physician, take one. Unfortunately, our education is kind of all over the place. So I have physicians who do a great job about goals of care, know what it is. I, When I went to my mother's family physician with her, he said, what? Mm -hmm. um, gave him my card, a little education. <laughs> so yeah, I was, I was that family. So it's all over the place. If you phone ahead uh, and say, I want the goals of care conversation, they can book extra time. Um, they can ready themselves so that they can be prepared for that conversation. It's not something that you want to tell somebody as they're trying to leave the office. So three takeaways. Um, the person practice is for everyone, right? It's for everyone over the age of 18. It's kind of like insurance. Right? It just kind of sits there until we need it. It makes our, our lives a lot easier if we have it. The other thing about the personal directive, it can be reversed. So we have people that have motor vehicle accidents, have had brain injuries, but then recover. That personal directive is enacted for that time, and then it can be reversed, and they're making their own decisions after. So it's a handy little document um, that even though you have a personal directive, you may need that goal of care, and that we want to think of if you have a green sleeve, that it's your medical passport. You wouldn't think of leaving if you're traveling home without your passport. Um, so that's why we want you to think of your green sleeve sort of as your passport. Children also have goals of care. Um, they go to school, they have that goals of care in their backpack because we have children that are very ill and have specific um, interventions that their family wants and they want. So they, they also carry a goal, uh, goal of care sleeve. So this is our website. All our resources are on it. We have links to the Guardian's office, so if you can't remember anything else, our information is on the handouts. We also have a national speak up um, uh, website that is about advanced care planning across Canada. 
it also has links to different provinces. Unfortunately, every province has a different system. So if you have somebody coming from a different province, you might want to look at it um, to see in terms of how it coincides with ours. Alberta's made it really easy. We can accept any document as a personal directive as long as it's signed, witnessed, and dated, and names an agent, so it has that in that. If from some provinces, I think it's Ontario, but don't quote me, they actually have a personal directive kind of embedded in their enduring power of attorney, so you actually have to read through the whole document to see if they have one, so it sort of makes our lives a little bit interesting. And I'm done. Did I make it? Yep. Question to everyone. Make sure that before you're done, you also complete this evaluation of the course. Uh, from a planner's point of view, a roundtable discussion perhaps, would this be something that you'd want to put on your laundry list when you're doing a retirement plan, a financial plan, as a, a process to review with the clients? Maybe you could be the motivator for them taking action. I don't expect you to be a legal wizard on that. But maybe you could be the facilitator for getting them to go there with them or their family because you're probably better off than some of their family or them in talking about it. So you might have a role to play as a financial advisor in that area. So just to let you know, we did um, they did cross-Canada studies. More people talk to their financial advisor about their health care wishes than they do to their doctor. So... <laughs> That's I don't know what that says about our system, but any comment? Far in. Yeah. It is a lot to go through in, in detail one on one with clients. Um, I was wondering, is there regular opportunities for the public to learn about this yep. through uh, workshops? So we have a regular work workshop, I think, is it twice a year or four times a year out of South Health Campus. Um, unfortunately, we're, we, we don't have money to advertise, so that's why it makes it harder for us to do. We do presentations by request, but even if you gave out this Conversations Matter, it's booklet, it's free. You can order them from our website and just introduce the topic. We don't expect you to go all through it, but just so that you know it for yourselves and also recognize when somebody um, you know, is saying stuff that isn't right or is saying, I don't need one, so that you can give them the form and say, you know, I have my own personal directive. It's really important. Here's this booklet. You can go through it, right? So that's what we're, we're expecting. So you sort of, you know, have people go to our website, you know, if they want more information about it. Make a comment on the registration process mm -hmm. um, in terms of, you know, what's the added value for someone going that way and then how often have you seen it actually being utilized? Not a lot. So it actually was meant for healthcare providers, and I guess they probably do use it at most of the time. That's why we say give uh, many people your copy of the personal directive, so then it can land up in hospital if you land up in eMERGE. But sometimes it has saved people because what they can do is it just, they um, access the registry and then they have the name of the agent and the contact information, so then they would phone that agent. Okay. So that's how it's used. In an emergency yeah, situation. Yeah, in an emergency situation, so it's for healthcare providers. But there's also cards that you can carry saying who your agent is. So there's different ways to do okay. it. Is that something you perhaps could make part of your practice as a handle? How many people would like to see this again on the website for the IAFB? To access it. A lot of content. I mean, I'm, we could, I don't know if we want to resend out a presentation, but I think it would be better off if you could access this webinar on the website. Correct? Mm -hmm. Did your husband actually put in that he wanted to jump off and get pushed No, up? he told me that personally. <laughs> <laughs> Would that be legal if I wanted to put it in? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> you want to go to heaven, you just want to go tonight, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How likely is it that if someone was in the hospital and their health was teetering, they still had capacity, but they hadn't already had a personal directive, that they could bring a lawyer and I know it doesn't have to be a lawyer but do people do that like, all the time in the hospital get someone in do yeah. the document so sometimes they'll call a lawyer in um, and or sometimes a social worker will will help them do it the issue with those is usually because it's time sensitive all we can get usually is just the agent name mm -hmm. um, so all that other stuff is blank so it doesn't really give us any any a lot of information 
Okay. But at least okay. we have an agent. But like I said, not a lot of thought process in terms sure. of doing it, right? Yeah. And that conversation doesn't really happen. Sorry. And I can add to that. We just did one on Friday. Mm. No, last Thursday, sorry, at the hospital for a client who suffered a major heart attack and mm -hmm. was scheduled for triple bypass and had no personal directive. And um, there are a couple of lawyers out there uh, who are extremely good at this, who um, had everything that you've mentioned, uh, and it was all done uh, at bedside with uh, one of their assistants, and I was there with the client, mm. and it, it went really, really well, and it gave her just a huge sense of peace. Mm. Yeah, that was just last Thursday. Great. Yeah. That's good to know. Yeah. What percentage of people as a near death actually have a personal directive in place? Um, I couldn't tell you a near death. We do know, uh, I think right now, in terms of the people that we did the study in Alberta, and I think we're up to about 40% in terms of, but you know, that's people like that answer population. general population. So I don't know what the age is. Usually the older people are, then they have a personal directive. But the issue with it is, you know, some of the things I talked about, it's not really valuable because it's kind of one of these that are you know, they've just changed the name, but this is the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that's the thing I think that's kind of missing here is that there doesn't seem to be the bridge between the health community and the legal community. So because the legal community has to prepare the medical directive that you've given lots of things. We just recently did ours, and <clears throat> it was very basic. And so they don't seem, the, the legal community doesn't seem to be that well informed about what is, they, they're right, they're, they're taking it, like, change the name down yeah. here. Yeah. And it's not adequate. So, but the legal community then affects the, the doctor's decision. So basically, it's, it, they need to be trained and what you're looking for yeah. when people come. So, uh, province-wide, lawyers met with our, um, we have a Dr. Uh, Jessica Simon is the physician we work with. She's done a lot of studies around advanced care planning and goals of care. She's sort of our guru uh, for Calgary and the province. So she's met with the lawyers and they've come up with a legal toolkit and they will be in terms of educating lawyers. So it has been recognized that it's an issue. I don't, I wasn't involved in that, so I don't know how lawyers get their education after. I don't know if this is going to be mandatory. You know, our wish is that this is something that you learn in high school. This is something you learn along the way so that whether you're a lawyer or whatever you are, you're going to have this information. That would be our ideal. Mm -hmm. But we are, what, it's exactly true in terms of what the lawyers think need to be in there and what we need in there doesn't mesh. Right. But it's a billable time issue too. Could be. There's a whole yeah. educational aspect. So yeah. they're interested in getting the appointment in place yeah. and getting a, a valid document in place. But what you're talking about is this whole goals of care. That's the goals of care are separate, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, in terms so of whatever. So when I did my uh, personal directive and will and all the rest of it, and you have know, them together, we did a flat rate, right? I talked back and forth in terms of I said this is what I want in. I did my you know homework in terms of what I wanted in. They gave it back to me, and I said no, that's not what I said. You know, wait again. So it wasn't that expensive in terms of to get what I wanted in the personal directive, right? So it wasn't that bad. But you have to do your homework and know what you want in it. And that's the issue. If you've never thought about it, yeah. you're not going to do it in the lawyer's office. Is there a list of questions for you to kind of think through ahead of time? Um, yeah, so we've given out to the booklet. The booklet's really good in terms of walking you through in terms of that process and things that you can think about. But we, you can't cover every situation. So that's why we do talk about talking with your physician because your medical situation is going to look different than mine, right? And so you really need that medical input. But we have sample questions. We have things to think about. Um, you know, the, the, for healthy people, it's going to look different than if you, you're not healthy, right? So we just, you're lucky we just came out with this booklet. I think it's pretty good. Um, probably not perfect, but it goes through the goals of care. It goes through what things that you should think about. Sorry, this is a follow-up. So what happens for someone that doesn't have a personal directive or goals of care and they end up in a situation? Like, is there, what happens? Who's making the decision? So if... Um, by Alberta Health Services policy and procedure, we do not need consent for the goals of care. So the physician can set the goals of care without consent. They do need to 
um, notify the family or the substitute decision maker. If you have no substitute decision maker, nobody making decisions for you, land up and emerge, let's say, um, if it's an emergency, they're just going to do what they need to do uh, in terms of what information they have. Uh, if they need further medical uh, decisions, they're going to fill out what's called a Form 6, um, and that lists people, it goes husband and wife, including common law, and then it goes by relatives, you know, children, you know, grandchildren, grandparents, whatever is in the right order. Um, but that, like I said, it's only relative. And they have to, the physician signs that, and it's the physician's decision about who he or she picks. So um, um, also with that is a new form has to be done with every decision, and it's only for medical decisions, and it's not for end of life. If an end of life decision had to be made and more decisions, then either a family member would go to court um, to get guardianship order or us as healthcare providers would make an application to the public guardian to be appointed, which can or cannot happen. Sometimes the public guardian in Calgary says, keep on doing the form sixes, which isn't the best. Well, thank you very much. It's been a great talk, Alexander. Thank you very much for being here.